Um, actually, the video and the comments by, by the three presenters are, are actually an incredible introduction <laughs> for Professor Pauli's talk. And um, I'm sure Cheryl knew this and had it all lined up when she, when she um, put it all together. But um, I ask you to think about that as you listen as you reflect on the comments that you just heard, the video you just saw, and um, Professor Pauli's remarks. But let me just set them up a little bit. Um, I think specifically the issue of Woody, Woody as embracing the human element in both teaching, research, and engineering practice. Um, and I think that's an important thing to just keep, keep at, the, at the forefront. Um, to introduce Dr. Pauli, uh, she's an associate professor in the School of Engineering and an affiliate faculty member in the Gender, Women's, and Sexual Sexuality Studies Program in the Division of Environmental and Ecological Engineering at Purdue University. From 2008 to 2014, Professor Pauli was a co-PI of Purdue's Advanced Program, which focused on uh, the underrepresentation of women in STEM faculty positions. She received a career award in 2010 and a PCASE award in 2012 for her project, researching the stories of undergraduate engineering women and men of color and white women. Professor Pauli's goal through her work at Purdue, and this is where Woody's, Woody's thoughts and influence, I think, comes in, um, is to help people, including the engineering education profession, develop a vision of engineering education as more inclusive, engaged, and socially just. Uh, building on her belief that engineering education can and should be a means to develop more engaged citizens. So, the similarities. Um, this morning, Professor Pauli will help us consider the question, how should STEM education address equity, the climate crisis, and its own moral infrastructure? Please welcome Professor Alice Pauli. Thank you so much. That was great. I'm going to invite everybody to just stand up and like move a little bit. I have to set my computer here for a second anyway, or we'll be here for a little while. And I know that many of you had these deep connections with Professor Flowers. So, thank you so much for coming today. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Woody Flowers at one of um, our main disciplinary society conferences, the American Society for Engineering Education. I never had the privilege of being able to participate in FIRST Robotics, um, but I certainly knew about it, and my students talk about those experiences. I teach first-year engineering students at Purdue. Um, so it's a real privilege for me to be here. It's a privilege to um, follow up sort of on, on Woody Flowers uh, in, in his memory uh, this morning with you all. So I'm uh, an engineering faculty member at, in the School of Engineering Education at Purdue University. Um, how many of you have heard of the School of Engineering Education at Purdue? Oh, oh gosh. <laughs> Great. I'm excited. Thank you. So we're, for the rest of you, the first department in the country to focus on engineering education research as the grounds for tenuring faculty. Uh, Purdue was the first place to have a common first year engineering um, program in the 50s. Uh, and we have been innovating engineering education in various ways since then. Purdue's also the home to the first women in engineering program, um, and also the folks who started the National Society of Black Engineers were at Purdue, which is a really dubious honor if you think about it, as it means conditions were so difficult for them that they had to band together and start a national organization to get the support that they needed. We also offer an ABET accredited degree in multidisciplinary engineering for undergrads, and we have the world's first PhD program in engineering education. H here endeth the advertising, you'll be relieved to hear. Um, so I hope to share today some ideas with you that I've been thinking about over the last few months and then hear some of your thoughts on the subject, as I know already from talking with uh, folks this morning that there are many folks in the room who've been thinking about them longer than I. I want to start off with an acknowledgement of the territory we're on. How many of you have done this kind of thing uh, in an academic context before? A couple of people. Okay, great. So um, they're increasingly common in parts of the country and in some disciplines, and it's important for me to acknowledge that we're on stolen land, uh, given the whiteness of the argument I'm about to lay out, and who might be in the room here today. Uh, so it's also important for us not just to acknowledge these truths, but strive towards rectifying some of the wrongs that continue to do harm. So I'm going to be donating the a very generous honorarium you all are kind enough to have offered uh, to me to the Massachusetts Tribal Council. 
So I've drafted this statement to represent how I'm thinking about this here today, um, and I invite you to join me in reflecting on these issues. So we are sitting on the unceded territory of the Massachusetts people, lands that were taken by force and whose people are still among us. Many of us continue to unfairly benefit economically and in other ways from this acquisition by force. This acknowledgement compels me to think about how we as members of a broader academic community should act in these indigenous territories, how we might consider through our day-to-day -day work the problematic legacy that colonialism has inflicted upon these indigenous groups, including through our science and technology, and how we can invest those reflections in our efforts to address both the climate crisis and issues of diversity and equity. And I promise not to read any more slides after that. Um, I'd like a sense of who's in the room. Um, so how many of you identify as predominantly as students? Thank you. OK, how many of you identify as faculty? OK, and how many identify as staff? Awesome. Thank you. OK, different dimension now. How many of you see your alliances mine mainly with science? OK, how about engineering? OK, how about technology? All right, how about social sciences? Thank you for coming. How about something else? Thank you to the something else folks, particularly for coming. Um, OK, how many of you see yourselves as doing work related to climate change? OK, great. And how about diversity and inclusion? OK, great. That's really helpful. Thank you so much. OK, so I'm going to start off with a question. What is MIT doing around the climate crisis? Why, why start small? You know. Um, and maybe you have a big answer here. Uh, it's a variation on a question that my dad used to ask me every time we gathered together as a family. And that was, you know, more surprising and unsurprisingly, what is Purdue doing around the climate crisis? So I'm a faculty member in engineering education. And for my research, I study how we make engineering educational institutions that keep engineering predominantly white and male. I admit that while I've focused on institutional racism and sexism, I rather hope that other people at Purdue were sort of focusing on the climate crisis. And they are. I'll come back to this. During winter break last year, this question changed. He asked, what are you doing to reduce climate emissions by 50% in 11 years? Specific, measurable. Or now, given that it's over a year later, 10 years. This got my attention in a new way. I help teach first-year engi first engineering students in sections of 120 students. How many of you are in a class of 120 students? A couple of people, <laughs> the instructors maybe. Uh, so I, I teach them in teams of four. So there are 30 teams per class with, I get half a TA and four peer teachers and two undergraduate graders to manage 120 students, plus a lot of support t um, staff. I started asking how much of our content was organized to prepare these first year students not just to live in a world making 50% fewer climate emissions seven years after they graduate, if they're lucky, more likely six years afterwards, but to actually produce a world making 50% fewer climate emissions six years after they graduate. You might be thinking uh, about maybe students who are in your classes, how, who they are going to become, how you are preparing them or not to make either to either make or prepare to live in a world making 50% fewer climate emissions in 10 years, or more scarily, continuing to make climate emissions at our current rates. Perhaps you're doing a lot here. But collectively, as a profession in engineering and education, broadly speaking, uh, and STEM education, broadly speaking, I think we're not doing nearly enough. Yet my colleagues and I are all convinced about the necessity of making large-scale change. We don't doubt the science. Those are not us. Um, but despite my commitment and concern and my preparation as an engineering education scholar, I don't even know where to start. So I admit here in front of you all that I do almost nothing and I panic as I do so. Well, my dad died very si suddenly in March playing tennis. He keeled over at the age of 75. He was an electrical engineer uh, from Carnegie Tech, as was then, and a scientist and a climate activist. He wrote the handbook, edited the handbook on confocal mi um, biological uh, microscopy. And uh, he went to the March for the Climate in DC in 2017 and helped organize a climate march in Vancouver, BC, near where he retired. <laughs> 
He was on the board of his local solar co-op and did not hesitate to speak to complete strangers, including members of parliament, about the necessity for immediate, drastic climate action. So, of course, with his death, I started thinking much more significantly about this question. My dad's strategy for convincing people about the need to move on the climate crisis was based in scientific fact. He would teach courses about climate change at Capilano College, the local community college, and ran the local elder college. He had reams of keynote slide decks, because not PowerPoint, because he was a Mac guy, uh, where he had snapped screenshots of graphs of keeling curves and the newest model of global emissions projections incorporating positive feedback loops, the complexities of climate warming based on different greenhouse gases, increased clouds, melting permafrost, releasing frozen methane, ocean, ocean acidification, deforestation, wildfires, alternative agricultural regimes, growth projections of renewables, and so on. With only the slightest encouragement, sometimes quite unintentional encouragement, he would pull out his laptop at parties, I'm not kidding, planes, buses, and ferries, and regale a quite taken aback audience with fervent impromptu lectures on the importance of keeping fossil fuels in the ground, starting immediately, including chapter and verse of scientific notation, or scientific notation, citation. Citation. Notation too, but I meant citation. And yet, like I did, those audiences would quite often glaze over, and you know that they would go home and tell stories of the eccentric stranger they met at a party, or on the plane, or on the bus, or on the ferry, and go along with business as usual. Linguist George Lakoff calls this form of argument as relying on enlightenment reason. The belief that presenting a rational argument based on data and evidence leads people to act rationally. But, he points out, people frequently don't act in their own interests. He has specific commentary for political progressives who, he says, rely on enlightenment reason to their own detriment. So, for example, to counter the climate crisis, he notes how progressives carefully lay out and describe its myriad ill effects. But somehow, their well-reasoned and scientifically supported arguments about impending catastrophe fail to mobilize a large fraction of political actors. Dan Sarowitz has also talked about this under the idea of the myth of authoritativeness. Lakoff has other useful tools for us to think about the climate crisis, too. He talks about the act of framing and how it influences the brain's cognitive structures to explain how much more successful conservatives have been than progressives at communicating their moral value system in the United States. He also talks about how people are really good at understanding direct causation, but less good at thinking about systemic causation. And so I'll, I'll come back to these ideas. My dad and I had an argument in 2018. He felt strongly that the Me Too movement was a colossal and dangerous distraction when all we really needed to be focusing on was the climate crisis. He would roll his eyes when some new allegation of sexual abuse came out. I think from a place of thinking, how bad can this be compared to the death of the human race on the planet? You know, that's a, a valid point. I saw those eye rolls, though. And even though I knew I would get yelled at, I objected to his framing. My response was that he was making a wedge argument and that instead we could think about how Me Too and the climate crisis were related to each other. This is the crux of my argument today. I think there are similarities between our collective insufficient action on the climate crisis and our collective insufficient action uh, on issues of diversity and equity. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to lay out a few of the pieces I think point us in this direction and then see what those ideas prompt you to think about. So I've already introduced uh, Lakoff, but I haven't connected him to the diversity and equity part of the argument, so I'm going to do that now. So I have been in the field of uh, diversity and equity in engineering education now since the early 2000s. Um, in fact, shortly after arriving at Purdue, I became the co-PI of Purdue's advanced uh, project focused on women in STEM faculty positions. And I, I, have, I, I have read all of MIT's reports on your difficulties in this area, too. So uh, it's really, I'm so excited to be here. Uh, I regularly hear administrators talk about how much they care for, about improving the inclusion of women and people of color in STEM areas. They ask for data-driven solutions. And then I see researchers present a wealth of data about what the problems are for women and people of color in STEM areas. And maybe this is familiar to you, too. And then I watch as administrators overlook all that data and ask for more data organized in a whole other set of ways. 
So Lakoff makes me ask, how much data do administrators need to see to realize not only are there enormous problems with how we recruit and retain minoritized students, staff, and faculty, but that they have something to, they have to do something big and systemic about them. I know that uh, you folks here are dealing with your own crisis around the Epstein donations and what the normalcy of those donations means regarding your culture. I've read about how people here are pointing out how this crisis is not that different from the broader movement of Me Too. But the reason I bring it up here is because of the recent release of, of the reports detailing the investigation into the Epstein donations and how MIT has responded in its wake. So we see this repeated, this, this sort of question of there's data, uh, it suggests a particular course of action, we need some more data, repeated in the context of the climate crisis too. Global report after global report from the IPCC to other bodies detail with the data uh, the extent, speed, future trajectory of the climate crisis. And then we see people in power failing to act on those data and instead ask for more data of different sorts. So how much data do people in power need? Uh, how, much do need how much do they need to see that they need to enact some kind of sufficient change? Lakoff would say, perhaps it's not about the data. It's not about needing data to conv convince people of a rational argument. So what is it about? Ultimately, and I invoke Dr. Bell here, who I know I haven't introduced yet, uh, Bell and others would say it's a strategy for inaction from people who have a vested interest in the system remaining exclusive and with them in power. Perhaps that has resonance for you here. So instead, maybe we need to reframe how we approach our argument. So besides Lakoff, there are three other scholars I'm going to draw on for my claims today. First, there's Gert Biesta, who's an educational faculty member in Ireland. He wrote a thought-provoking piece in educational theory a few, few years ago called Why What Works Won't Work, Evidence-Based Practice and the Democratic Deficit in Educational Research. In it, he decries the calls for basing educational policy largely on evidence, not because he rejects the Enlightenment project of looking for evidence, but because he notes how evidence-based research has been interpreted to mean not only empirical research, but experimental-based research following the model of randomized controlled field trials of research-based medicine, despite the obvious and myriad differences between education and medicine. He then lays out umpteen problems with basing all educational policy on that so-called evidence-based research, as some places, such as the UK, have, have pushed. Biesta argues that, oh, I beg your pardon. Biesta argues that we can't answer all the questions we have, or we should have, about education with only empirical educational research. In the context of our discussion on STEM education, how does one ask empirical questions about what the purpose of scientific or technical education is or should be? Who should be educated as scientists, engineers, computer scientists, mathematicians, and why? And what they should know in the broader context of the world and why? You can't, or perhaps I should say oughtn't, answer moral and political questions through field trials. But if you build your policy infrastructure to only look for enlightenment through this type of research, you lose the ability and opportunity to talk about these other important questions about value, worth, purpose, and direction of education. Biesta argues that asking such questions is actually at the heart of our democracy, uh, of our being a democracy. Quote, okay, I lied a little bit. I'm gonna read a little bit of the quote. A democratic society is precisely one in which the purpose of education is not given, but is a constant topic for discussion and deliberation, end quote. Instead, as he argues, we can't just look at empirical research to inform our educational practice, but we have to look at the interrelations between policy, practice, and research to remind ourselves that education is a moral and a political practice. I'm gonna say that again, that education is a moral and political practice. Education's moral and political nature won't go away if we in STEM fail to talk about it. But I think most scientists and technical professionals in acad academia have dropped the infrastructure required to be able to talk about it. Do we talk about this in journals, conferences? How do we prepare our students to talk about their moral obligation in the world or the political nature of the work that they do? 
It seems for the most part that we in STEM are happy to reproduce a fairly depoliticized curriculum for our students with the argument that that's not my department, or how can mathematics be political, or science is objective, don't bring your politics into my science, or most insidiously, I am not prepared, I do not have the background to talk about those things, and so I rely on others' expertise to address those things. So that many of us continue to perpetuate such myths in the face of reams of evidence to the contrary is part of the evidence that we don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> the third scholar I draw on is Dorothy Smith. Uh, she's a feminist sociologist and faculty emerita in Canada. Uh, Smith talks about the importance of studying institutions through their ruling relations, uh, which are the ways that people and texts coordinate social relations to enact the interests of a ruling group, sometimes over their own interests. So I will give you what might appear on its face to be a fairly trivial example from Purdue. Last fall, I tried to contact faculty colleagues outside of my department and in my college of engineering to organize around both a climate strike back in September. Anybody participate in the, the September climate strikes? Nice. I know there was a big deal, uh, big happening uh, in Boston. And how about in, in, did you do anything around Black Friday or the first week of December? There was another set of climate strikes. Next one will be um, uh, April 22nd, the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. So make your plans now. Um, so I was trying to get uh, people to see how were we going to uh, we were trying to do a teach-in for the September uh, climate strikes. And I was also looking to put together a grant proposal to redesign our engineering curriculum around the climate crisis, N not just for the environmental engineers, but for all the engineers. How does your average engineering student learn about the climate crisis? Um, so I send it to our college faculty listserv. So our, my college is about 400 faculty, to give you a sense of scale. Um, so I send it to the college listserv. I waited for it to be approved by the administrative assistant to the dean, and it was not. I waited about a week. I called to find out what had happened, and the administrator told me that the associate dean for faculty affairs had deleted it, claiming that the faculty listserv is to be used only for announcing things like seminars. There's no written policy that I could find governing this listserv. I asked for an explanation uh, from the associate dean, and I have not still received one. So in a time of spam, phishing, online fraud, cyber attacks, and such, one must have a moderated listserv. I get that. But at the same time, our college exists in a time of decreasing public funds. And at Purdue, we are a public land-grant institution, so we also have increasing expenses and decreasing public funds. And administrators are increasingly looking to donors to help make up the shortfall from, public, uh, uh, from those, the decreasing public funds. It could be inconvenient for the dean to have to explain to big donors who made their money from fossil fuels why their faculty, why their faculty were rabble-rousing against the climate crisis. But it would be impolitic at a public institution to be explicit about squashing that uh, initiative. So how might an administration restrict conversation about climate change? What about creating a neutral-sounding policy restricting use of the faculty listserv to announcements of departmental seminars? That might be an effective way to avoid uncomfortable conversations with funders without looking like you're imposing facu on faculty members' academic freedom. And indeed, shortly after, I received word that the associate dean was preparing a policy to govern the faculty listserv too restricted from discussions and focusing it only on the college's business. This is at the same time of many conversations about decreasing silos and, and trying to promote cross-departmental uh, collaborations and so forth, right? Right. So um, this also has spread to other colleges at Purdue, uh, including the College of Liberal Arts, which seems interesting. So to bring it back to ruling relations, Smith would ask in this situation, who are the players? Who actually clicks the button? How do conversations about climate change being restricted actually happen? Who are the people who click the buttons? And then how do we frame conversations about the climate crisis as political and the absence of such conversations as neutral, as normal? How does policy govern these actions to produce an environment that appears neutral and impartial where faculty cannot talk with each other on their listserv about the climate crisis? How do we produce um, policies that serve ruling members' interests as neutral and impartial over the interests of the ruled? Investigating how ruling relations work allows us to analytically connect the macro dimensions 
like the climate crisis or like gender, race, and class, to the micro experiences of individuals through the meso level of institutions, institutional structure. Smith works, Smith's work helps us focus on how people and texts operate together to produce an institutional structure where the absence of conversations about the climate crisis is normal and anything else is politicized. To bring it to issues of equity, how do we write policy that looks completely neutral and fair but produces a predominantly white and male professoriate or student body while simultaneously casting aspersions on anyone who takes issues with the neutrality of the policy in the first place? Then combine this with the idea from earlier that we in STEM are ill-equipped to have political and moral discussions in the first place. So hold on to this idea of ruling relations. And then the fourth scholar is uh, Dr. Ger Derek Bell, a critical legal studies critical legal study scholar from uh, Harvard up the way. Um, he died several years ago, but um, whose work on critical race theory in the United States produced the idea of interest convergence. This is the argument that race relations change for the benefit of minoritized people, for people of color, if and only if it is also in white people's interests. Bell talks about the common mistaken belief, particularly of liberal white folks like me, that racism is a blot on the face of democracy that we just need to scrub off. And instead, he argues that racism is built into democracy. To remove it, we have to reconceptualize what democracy is without it. So while I think there are direct connections between Bell's argument and STEM's persisting gender and racial inequality, I think the idea I want you to hold on to here is that change only happens when it's in the powerful's interest for it to change. If change is not happening, then our question should be, in whose interest is it for institutional climate or educational policy or environmental policy to not change? And if we accept the idea that social inequality is baked into our founding documents, whether they be the Constitution or the faculty handbook, not by accident, but by intent, then how must we then have a new conversation that rec reconceives of our important institutions in the face of social justice? So another important conversation which scientists, engineers, and mathematicians, and technical professionals are ill-equipped to have. So how do all these pieces fit together? So hopefully you can see some connections. I'm saying here that the logics that keep us hurtling towards climate cl catastrophe are related to the logics that maintain the hierarchical subordination of various groups who, of course, will disproportionately suffer climate catastrophe. Feminist scholars have argued for decades that environmental devastation wrought by humanity stems in part from a belief that humans can triumph over nature and that this belief is related to the same kind of logic that makes people believe in a racial hierarchy or a gender hierarchy. In other words, the same way that we have operationalized racial hierarchy for the benefit of white people, or operationalized gender hierarchy for the benefit of cisgendered men, or operationalized class hierarchy for the benefit of the wealthy, or operationalized colonization hierarchy for the benefit of the colonizers, we operationalized a hierarchy of humanity over nature, able to control and plunder nature for our own benefit. The logics are parallel and related. Gender and race in context-specific patterns are fundamental dimensions for organizing society, and the resulting hegemonic masculinity, white supremacy, colonization, they construct logics of domination that function to order power in other domains, like in humanity's relationship with nature. This domination is therefore what behind, lies behind our collective inertia in dealing with the climate crisis. To escape this hierarchical thinking, we broadly, but particularly in STEM, need to use social theory and logics to think about equity and to question humans' domination over nature. We in STEM need to recognize how these logics embody a morality about the world and that there exist other ways of thinking about the world outside of logics of domination and hierarchy. Environmental journalism helps illustrate the climate side of this argument, and I'm going to focus on it for a few minutes here. Guardian journalist Martin Lukacs notes the individual exhortations to recycle, turn off the lights or use more LED lights, eat less meat, or most dra more dramatically, limit your number of children in order to save the planet. He argues that such exhortations are like rearranging the chairs on the Titanic. He blames reliance on such inadequate solutions on neoliberalism, which he argues has sold us a bill of goods by persuading us that we can address climate change through individual acts of conservation. He points out 
that 71% of global climate emissions since 1988 are the responsibility of only 100 companies. Yet instead of holding these companies accountable, independent individuals are instead urged to stop having children. Lukacs argues that the Reagan-Thatcher political project of neoliberalism has pursued two main aims. First, to dismantle barriers to the exercise of unaccountable private powder, power, and second, to erect barriers to the exercise of democratic public will. It has done this through, quote, privatization, deregulation, tax cuts, and free trade deals, which have allowed corporations to accumulate enormous profits and treat the atmosphere like a sewage dump while deterring planning for our collective welfare, end quote. So no ecosystem service charges here. To respond to the climate crisis, he says, we need to overcome all neoliberalism's free market mantras, reassert public control of energy grids, require corporations to phase out fossil fuels, and raise, raise taxes, raise taxes, to pay for massive investment in climate-ready infrastructure and renewable energy. But neoliberalism has not only ins merely ensured that this, that this agenda is politically unrealistic, it has also tried to make it culturally unthinkable. Its celebration of competitive self-interest and hyper-individualism, its stigmatization of compassion and solidarity has frayed our collective bonds. So how are we preparing? How are we educating our students to think about these problematic logics? How are we preparing future scientists, engineers, computer scientists, and other STEM professionals to advocate for public control over energy grids, to pressure their employers to phase out fossil fuel use, or to demonstrate in the streets to raise taxes to pay for climate-ready infrastructure? While there have been National Science Foundation investments and some places have transformed curricula, little evidence exists that STEM educators are adequately responding to the climate crisis. Rather, by failing to provide students with a moral language to think about STEM professionals' responsibility for climate change, we are making things worse. We have failed to frame for students that are preparing them for seeming, seemingly inevitable employment in private industry results from a choice of logics and that this could be otherwise. This failure forms a devastating hidden curriculum. For example, we do not help students learn that social constructions like market behavior continue to drive political decisions as we careen towards climate catastrophe. And instead, most of us, perhaps unwittingly so, indoctrinate students into neoliberalism as the only possible mode of economic development. Their job will be to work in an industrial machine. We don't articulate alternative modes of thought or help students develop cognitive lenses to conceive of a way of being outside this neoliberal worldview. Perhaps things are different at MIT. I see shaking heads. Uh, but in this case, I don't think so. We also teach students uh, that their role in the economic production system will be as management, as leaders, as innovators, not labor, effectively hamstringing their education and collective organizing. We don't need to learn how to work together. We pull ourselves up with our bootstraps. As a result, it probably won't cross most STEM professionals' minds that organizing across employment levels from line worker to CEO to pressure company bosses to cut carbon emissions might actually work. So they won't bother with it, which is a convenience to the corporate owners for sure. So let's recall Smith's ruling relations theory, investigating how people activate texts and policies that work to structure social relations in the interests of a ruling group rather than in their own. And that's not to say that engineers haven't unionized, as those of us uh, who remember the Boeing strikes in 2000 might remember. And political scientist Erica Chenoweth, from down the road here, uh, has talked about the 3.5% rule, which is the idea that it takes only 3.5% of the general population to engage in active protest to prompt serious political change. We have seen some places in tech where workers have pressured their company to advocate for radical climate emission reduction, as well as regarding toxic culture against women and people of color. But for your run-of-the-mill companies, where most STEM professionals educated nationally end up working, the prospect of even 3.5% of scientists or engineers organizing in a company to advocate for radical climate emission reduction, or even for more equitable work culture, feels unlikely. <laughs> 
So add to this lack of education about uh, political systems and how they work and what their alternatives might be. Another point by Lakoff that people are generally ill-prepared to think about systemic causality in contrast with individual causality. The climate crisis is created by systemic causality, as is STEM's persisting demographic homogeneity. But in STEM education, well, in engineering education specifically, and in research ethics education, and I suspect elsewhere in STEM, uh, technical ethics education overwhelmingly overfocuses on individual causality. How do you not lie, cheat, and steal in your job? And so by this, I mean what the scholars Joe Herkert has translated as the difference between microethics where the Challenger explosion, which we just had the anniversary of yesterday, supposedly resulted from specific engineers' poor judgment on O-rings, and macroethics, which would be more aligned with Diane Vaughn's work on the Challenger disaster, where we start to ask big questions about the structure and focus of engineering as a profession, and how facts themselves are socially produced. Maybe you'll agree that it appears to be effective social control to keep STEM professionals focused on microethics, and without the skills or vocabulary to think about macroethics. Frankly, it seems likely that it's in many employers' interests in the context of modern global capitalism to keep their employees from being able to critique neoliberalism. So what would Lakoff say here? So I think he would bring our attention back to the issue of enlightenment reason. The antidote to ineffective enlightenment reason and framing is, he suggests, a conversation about morality and values. There are profoundly moral consequences to STEM work, but the story scientists and engineers tell ourselves about the professional role that we play pays little attention to that moral role. Neoliberalism abdicates these professions' moral choices to the market, but as economists have articulated, the market is, in, is distorted in uh, many ways. Similarly, moral consequences result from defining our various professions in terms of power relations built into white supremacy, patriarchy, capitalism, colonialism, and heteronormativity, and doing it in such a way that professionals don't have the language and intellectual skills to critique that definition. However, following Lakoff's recommendation that we think about morality and values presents us with this challenge, because so many of us, including me, don't have adequate structures or training to do this. We are accustomed to thinking about ethics mainly in terms of individual accountability, microethics, and direct, not systemic, causality. Moreover, as Biesta points out, relying on evidence-based research diverts us from even considering or questions that can't be answered empirically, but are nevertheless crucially important, like what is the purpose of STEM education and who should decide. As we've seen, our normal neoliberalism mindset makes it unthinkable even to ask the right kinds of questions with regard to the climate crisis. Thinking about diversity and equity in STEM presents us with the same type of challenge. And just as thinking seriously about the climate crisis requires us to radically confront our collective choices about our way of life, so does uh, thinking seriously about equity and diversity. So what do we do? So before I go farther, I want to acknowledge this problematic thing known as white saviorism, which is the way that white people act uh, as though they alone have got the solution to the social problems, even though A, they can be a large part of the problem, and B, people of color have been working away at various social problems for a long time already. There was a great article in Yes Magazine uh, a few years ago where author Aura Bogato called for no more white saviors in various social movements. And so this is important for me as a white person to think about and keep in the front of my mind, and I think this is relevant for thinking about the climate crisis and issues of diversity and equity. Bogato in instead encouraged white folks looking towards, to work towards justice to think about the Zapatista saying, preguntando caminamos. I, my Spanish is not great, my French is better, but I, I hope that that is reasonably understandable, which I understand to mean uh, asking questions we walk. So I'm going to ask some more questions with you today. Often when I give talks about my gender and race research, people ask how to make the biggest impact. And inside our techno-rational logic, that makes sense. STEM professionals, particularly engineers uh, looking to optimize, uh, seek questions to practical answers of where is the best place to start and how do we get the biggest bang for our buck? In contrast, with respect to the climate crisis, we see myriad ways that we can save the planet without changing almost anything in how we as individuals exist in the world. Change your light bulbs to LEDs, buy recyclable toothbrushes, 
eat impossible burgers instead of beef burgers, they are delicious. <laughs> Although they are in opposite directions, these two strategies reveal the broader strategy for inaction in the interests of those of the ruling class. Looking for the lever of biggest impact implies firstly that you don't have to deal with the smaller stuff. After all, maybe the biggest intervention will work well enough that we can ignore the rest. And secondly, that we should wait to do anything at all until we found the biggest thing to start with. Looking for the small stuff, of course, demonstrates the hope we don't ever have to progress to the big stuff because who is prepared to have that conversation and come to a conclusion that doesn't result in the rich getting richer and the planet getting hotter? Now, I'm an engineer. I know the normal, normal engineering response to a problem might be to use our expertise to propose a solution and iterate on it a bunch of times. But in this case, I think we need to set aside this mindset, returning to those problematic systems of logic I talked about earlier. I, spoiler alert, I don't have the answers for how to create an infrastructure for all of us to talk about values and morality. Indeed, I think that seeking an answer from a central figure is itself problematic. Rather, I think we should go back to asking questions we walk. So here the question is, where do we start? As individuals, as students, employees, and citizens, we can feel overwhelmed by the questions we need to ask, let alone what the potential answers are. Washington Post reporter Dan Zak acknowledges our overwhelmedness with regard to the climate crisis, as well as the danger of the resulting paralysis. He says, quote, but here's where you stop reading. Because you have a mortgage payment to scrape together. You have a kid to pick up from school. You have a migraine. The US government is in shambles. You're sitting at your desk or on the subway, and deep in the southern Indian Ocean, blue whales are calling to each other at higher pitches to be able to be heard, to be heard over the crack and whoosh of melting polar ice. What do you even do with that? Indeed. But Zach gives us important advice too. Hold the problem in your mind. Freak out, but don't put it down. Give it a quarter turn. See it like a scientist and as a poet, as a descendant, and as an ancestor. So let us think then, as scientists, poets, descendants, as I'm the descendant of my dad, and as ancestors, as I will be for my two kids, Throughout history, there have always been, sometimes only a few, people in majority privileged positions working for justice. Historian Ibram Kendi tells us how, during Puritan times, some white people recognized slavery was wrong, knew that the massacre of native pe peoples was wrong, who recognized that their relative ease rested on the backs of miserable others, and that it was wrong. We want to be the descendants of the people who said slavery was wrong, not the people who just went along with injustice because it was positioned as normal. Not all of us are descendants of the anti-racist ancestors, and that's something for us to act on for our descendants in the here and now. We need to extrapolate from Kendi's words to also thinking about the climate crisis because of the similar logics of domination. We want to be the ancestors of our children or our friends and neighbors' children who worked like hell to limit climate catastrophe and didn't just ignore it because we had a migraine who had to get our kids from school. Here and now, STEM educators can choose which stance to take with respect to both these mor great moral questions on whether or not we will take up big conversations about STEM equity and about the climate crisis and knowing that the issues are related. Ultimately, this thing that we call science or engineering, what it is, how it thinks about what it means for something to be true or real, is socially constructed. By which I mean that the most true answer for what it means to be a scientist or an engineer or to participate in STEM is not written in some book somewhere up in the sky and if you somehow figure it out before you die, you win. Socially constructed means that there's not one right and perfect definition. Instead, it means that what STEM is, is defined in our collective minds, our action and practice, our texts, and as Dorothy Smith put it, our textually mediated social relations. It's on our relationships as STEM professionals with each other and with non-STEM folks and with our planet, which is not able to absorb our climate emissions without heating up. Science and engineering socially constructed nature is massive and seemingly immutable but in fact also affords us the opportunity for change. After all, it's not gravity we're problematizing, just this thing with hundreds if not thousands of years of history. Phew. 
Although climate change, that's pretty inevitable if we don't do radical change immediately. So thinking about these issues, I feel my colleagues and I, as engineering educators, confront the existential question, how we decide to be, to act, to think, having heard these ideas, says something about the metal of our souls, both as engineers and as educators. Because we're deciding how we're going to perform this thing called engineering. We're deciding now, both individually and together, and indeed have been all along. Are we going to continue to advance the power relations of the ruling class in hopes that we might join them at whatever social and planetary cost? Or will we move to enact radical change for increased justice to both people and planet? Given this reality, given your context, I ask, how are you going to decide to be? How are you going to try to have these moral conversations and learn to do better at them despite the fact that the broader educational system, for the most part, has been built to enable you to avoid having them in the context of your technical studies and work. And of course, let's think about this in the context of the broader Epstein crisis. Although given my outsider status here, I will leave it to my imminent colleagues on the panel to be more explicit about those connections. So for myself, I am focused on helping us develop our moral infrastructure around, around both equity and the climate crisis. Those of us in majority social positions need to position ourselves in visible, audible, and functional coalition with broader efforts and movements around both equity and climate change in order to disrupt the dominant logics that function in STEM, STEM education, and broader life that maintain minoritized groups in an oppressed position whilst blaming them for that oppression, and which simultaneously function to have us fail to act sufficiently on the climate crisis. Because for me, at the end of the day, we are on this earth to be in community with one another. And what would it say about the metal of our souls if we acted in ways that continued to stay silent on issues of the climate crisis or on issues of inequality and injustice in STEM when we have heard stories that mean we know better? These are moral questions. We need to engage in moral discussions about them. And as we ask those questions, we must walk. Thank you for your time today. I look forward to our next discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to invite some, oh, first of all, I, I should have said, uh, I would be very grateful if somebody could tweet a picture of me taking, do, talking to y'all up here because otherwise I'd never get any pictures of myself presenting this Twitter handle up there. Uh, I want to invite some questions, but first I want you to peer review them. So that means those of you who are like sitting in splendid isolation by yourselves, uh, you're going to have to find somebody to chat with. I would like you to take two minutes to awkwardly make eye contact with somebody and talk with your neighbor about a question that you might have here and see if you can both make it a better question. So I'll give you two minutes. Please clap once. If you can hear me, please clap once. Awesome. Thank you. I don't have my chimes. I left them to, for my TA to teach my class with. Thank you. So I want to invite some questions. Uh, now that you've peer reviewed it from, with your uh, colleague, what are some comments, thoughts, reactions you have to these ideas today? Oh, OK. One, two. Thank you. I think you're supposed to wait for the mic to arrive. Hi, my name Hi. is Lucinda Lindy. Thank you. Um, and so my question to you is, are there any examples of something that you've seen that works, that, that would be a good way to kind of pull all the different themes, thoughts, et cetera, together, or even some of them? And it may not be the, in some engineering program that you feel like is doing this, but it may be a religious program, or it could, I don't know, it could be anything, but, you know, like, there are many principles and questions that were there, but like, how does, can you give an example of how stuff fits together, even if it doesn't fit together perfectly or, ex or address 100% of what you want to accomplish? <laughs> can I give an example? Uh, no. Um, I don't know, maybe someone else can help me if they have an example. I have no idea. I mean, I, I'm currently at the place, both in my research, I had, a, I had an existential crisis in uh, April of 20, I want to say, Ooh, 16, so my kid, second kid had just been born. And I uh, went to 
Google to participate in EDFU, which is one of their sort of, I don't know, unconference camps. And everyone there was like doing a whole bunch of stuff. And I had been writing a lot of papers that I was not clear anybody had been reading. I'm like, why am I doing that? And it let a fire under me to start thinking about how do I help people draw the line between the scholarship, feminist critical race scholarship that I was doing in engineering education and what that means for the classroom. So I have only just been um, trying to have a series of different conversations. I don't have any great exemplars, but I think that that also provides us opportunity for taking the, the folks who have also had a fire lit under them to do anything. We don't have to follow institutional isomorphism. We don't have to have a model. Like, let us use the creativity of the folks that we have to make something new, because I don't think there is a perfect solution here. So that's a long way of me dodging the question. Uh, do other people have examples where they're like, you know, there's this place that's doing this awesome thing. I think that means great opportunity. Oh, yes. Um, Can you pass the mic up front? A little bit. I'm sorry. Have you run around? Um, I had the opportunity uh, to work with a um, joint college class at Babson and um, Olin College in Wellesley. Mm -hmm. And uh, this class is called Affordable Design Entrepreneurship, where it's a, um, a incubator for undergraduates from Babson, Olin, and also Wellesley um, College students cross-register into it. And uh, these students are, are thought to think systemically about, um, about poverty and uh, about um, inequity and the structures that, uh, that make them present and then also work with uh, community partners that are addressing them via um, different means. So students cycle in and out of this class and uh, work on projects that are um, really uh, making lasting impact in communities in a, a human-centered designed way, a reciprocal and respectful way. And uh, it was a really great experience for me. That sounds awesome. Thank you. Uh, now that I've had a chance to think a little bit, I think there are places that are, are there are places that do social justice education. Like I'm even just thinking about places like the Highlander Center, where uh, folks are trained in how to organize and to engage in uh, uh, direct action in a variety of ways. Like I think it would be amazing to figure out how those types of learning experiences fit into a technical education. I'm, I'm trying to put together a um, series of uh, foundation projects or funding um, projects to try and prompt folks at Purdue and more broadly to take their generic, you know, sophomore level thermodynamics, statics class or whatever, and how do they take their regular course objectives and so forth and reorganize them in light of a post-fossil fuel economy? Like, have them think about that. Your general run-of-the-mill faculty member. How do we bring those types of ideas in, and then how do we help students, just as we have to think about for kids who start learning about um, social inequality and injustice, like how do we help students get the tools around social organizing to be able to work together? Because there are curricula about doing this. We just don't bring it into higher education. So thank you for the question. I'm going to keep thinking about it. There was a question back here. Yes, hello. Week. My name is Sally Hasslanger, and I'm a faculty member here in the Department of Philosophy, and my specialization is social justice. Oh my gosh, would you and, like to come up and... Yeah, so talk? one of the things That'd that it was great. worrisome to me is that I think you made a good point that many people in STEM are not well prepared to think very constructively about normative issues and issues of social justice. But we have a school called SHAS, the School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences, and this is what people think about in SHAS. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was quite striking that when you said, oh, what are we gonna do? You said, think like a poet, think like an ancestor, think like a descendant, when actually people specialize in history. People specialize in social policy and justice. People specialize in moral philosophy. And this is available at our very institutions.
So I would suggest that maybe you know you join with people at Purdue, some of whom I know, in the philosophy department or in political science or in history, who could actually provide some tools for people to draw on when they're trying to think about these things. Now, MIT has many classes in moral issues and social justice issues, some of which I teach. And we're also trying to build a bridge with the Schwarzman College of Computing. So there's actually work being done as we speak to try to incorporate, like in NEAT, through NEAT, some of you know about NEAT is the new engineering education, whatever, digital ethics, computational ethics, these sorts of things. These are on the ground happening. We're gonna make joint appointments with philosophy and the College of Computing. These are things that are happening right now. But there is a logic at MIT. The logic at MIT is Humanities, arts, and social sciences don't get us to the truth. They don't do empirical work, so that's not real. We don't have to pay attention. If you're gonna talk about ethics, the best you can do is talk about religion where it's not true. There is a secular ethics has been available since, since the pre-Socratics, right? This is thousands of years that people have been thinking systematically about moral and normative issues. And it's not all about religion. So I think that there's a separate logic at MIT and at other engineering and science schools that degrades and diminishes people who do work on normative issues. And part of the change that we need to see is taking that seriously. We are professionals, we are trained, we know the history of these issues, and I think that we've got to try and integrate internal to our institutions. Right. Thank you very much. So I want to, uh, absolutely. So I want to point out that at Purdue, I am actually partnering with folks who are trained in these areas. I'm glad for that. I also have uh, professional historians in my family who are particularly uh, good at reminding me of the longer arc. But what I think is, is important is thinking about the broader profession and how the broader profession, as you say, frames certain kinds of knowledge as valuable and other forms of knowledge as invaluable, right? And so, uh, so I take your, your broader point and I, I appreciate the context here at MIT. Um, I don't know who else was next. There was a hand over here, and then maybe we could... Okay, great. Uh, hi, so I first had a quick comment about um, sort of resources for in getting these conversations into um, STEM, um, and that's that I, I'm aware of a group called the Underrepresentation Curriculum, which I think is actually mostly physics high school teachers, but they're trying to... Uh, they're developing a set of materials for helping STEM teachers mm -hmm start conversations about the role of, of race and social justice and related topics in science, even within high school courses, so they're worth checking out. Um, an another thing, so I didn't get to peer review this, um, but... Uh, Splendid isolation. Well, no, we just didn't have time. Oh, okay, okay. Right. Um, no, that's good, that's good. Uh, but um, I'm, I, I've been thinking about the sort of the role of language in framing these things, which I've, I've forgotten your name. Michelle, Michelle here is a, a linguist and was talking about similar things. Um, and I think that STEM is a useful concept in talking about sort of how academia, how education is organized now, but I, I sort of worry that the focus on STEM, like you hear a lot about STEM, you hear a lot about STEAM, and it, similar to what we just heard, um, it sort of frames science as being uh, sort of monolithic, separate from social science. It sort of excludes social science and science, technology, um, engineering, arts, and mathematics. Sort of, they can't exist uh, independently of society, independently of politics, independently of history. And so I, I wonder if it wouldn't be good if we sort of stopped talking about STEAM and STEM um, in our kind of goals for the future of how we construct education. I don't know. Thank you. Yeah, no, interesting thing. I, I come from, so for you, STEAM, does that include arts or is it ag? Arts. Arts, okay. And at the land grant institution, STEAM is ag. <laughs> Just checking. Yeah. No, thank you for, the, thank you for that. And um, I mean, science is a human endeavor, right? Um, and so to think that somehow we, we can do science or think about science or discuss science without thinking about how it is a human endeavor seems so, uh, let's just say a bad idea. Um, but 
that is produced, right? That, that sense that we can, that is a produced thing that somehow does work for somebody. And we should be thinking about who and why. Um, I, I also uh, like to play in the science and technology study space, attend the like 4S conference and things every so often. It's interesting that there are, there are sociologists, sociologists and historians and folks who study how science happens, how engineering happens, and they talk to each other. And they don't seem to talk to scientists and engineers as much as they could. And so I mean, that's another thing to think about too is, is how, not just how, I mean, how do I, this is actually getting into a rabbit hole. My name is Alice, I go down rabbit holes every so often. But, you know, so the broader interest of like, why do we, des why do we designate boundaries around social groups in the first place? is because they do work for us as social groups, right? In, I mean, as, as social beings. And so STEM is doing work for, the designation of STEM is doing work in a variety of ways. And I'm hearing you say, let's problematize that kind of work. But I also want to think that, um, uh, the boundaries between STEM and other things don't, doesn't have to be this, don't have to have the same qualities as they have had in the past, right? And that that boundary is set up not just by the people who are, it is bounded around, but the other folks too. The folks who make decisions about STEM as other, as out there, rather than, uh, as not us, right? As much as the folks who are like, this is us, this is not us, that boundary is co-produced. And so I'm interested in how the folks in science and technology studies have much for those of us maybe who accept the identity of STEM to learn from and yet also don't, uh, we don't talk to each other. Um, there was another, yes, okay, one last question. Thank yeah, you. hi, um, I'm Kurt Newton. Uh, by day I'm director of OpenCourseWare at MIT, but I also do a tremendous amount of climate change work around the campus. Um, was able to be on the, uh, was a staff rep on the Climate Action Advisory Committee last year, and I wanted to reflect on the state of MIT's institutional or systemic approach to this and what we've learned over the five years since that plan was, was produced. There are five pillars in the plan. Two of them are very much about education, one of them about kind of the, the campus student experience, one of them about kind of sharing what we know with the world. Um, we're about at the end of the, the five-year arc of that, and I think by any objective measure, a lot more attention has been put on the research and science side of things than on the education piece of things. My hope is that that plan will be refreshed for another five years with much higher aspiration and in particular um, find opportunities to really get cranking on the education side of things. And I reflect on maybe the framing that we started with five years ago, um, uh, chairman of the corporation, Bob Millard, stated on the record that he did not see uh, climate change as a moral issue. And that hard separation, I think, sets us up for some of these situations. And I'm really hopeful that we can um, move on that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, yeah. Thank you very much.